So good evening and welcome. I'm Quentin Bajac, the uh, Joel and Anne Ehrenkranz Chief Curator of Photography here at MoMA and co-curator with uh, Roca Sana Marcos and Lucy Galoon of the Ocean of Images New Photography 2015 exhibition. Uh, before I begin my remarks, um, I would like to say that this program is made possible by the Anna Marie and Robert Shapiro Seminar and Lecture Endowment Fund, established by Jenny and Bob Savit, Kristen and Andrew Shapiro, and Robert Shapiro Jr. I know that Anna Marie is in the audience. Thank you so much. Your support means a lot to us. I would also like to thank uh, Kristen Gaylord, our curatorial assistant in the photography department, whose input both to the show and to the panel has been invaluable, as well as our colleagues from the education department, especially Sarah Kennedy for organizing that panel. So uh, Kristen, Sarah, thank you so much. I would of course lastly like to express my gratitude not only to the six artists that will be part of that panel tonight, but also to the other 16 artists that, that are included in the Ocean of Images exhibition and who are for a lot of them with us tonight and that I hope will jump into the conversation um, if they want to. So thank you to all of you for accepting our invitation. As probably a lot of you know, a new, new photography series is this fall 30 years old. It's not my intention tonight to give a lecture about uh, the history of new photography, but rather as an introduction to that panel, uh, to point out a few significant moments in the series. The series was uh, initiated in the fall of 1985 by uh, the then chief curator of photography, John Sharkovsky. And as more and more institutions and galleries were becoming as interested in photography as they were in what was becoming beginning to be referred as contemporary art, the new photography series was launched with the explicit goal of placing contemporary creation at the center of the department's programming. So the first edition, featured the four names of Judith Joy Ross, Michael Spano, Antonio Mendoza, Ziki Berman. Yes, as you see, these were all American photographers. Yes, these were all black and white prints framed and displayed vertically on the wall. Yet, if you have a closer look, uh, the exhibition represented a rather wide range of practice from the documentary approach of Judith Joy Ross, whose images you see here at the entrance, to the stage images of Ziki Berman from the near photo reportage of Antonio Mendoza to the experimental photograms of Michael Spano. In doing this, in choosing what I would say four unrelated photographers, John Tarkovsky was trying to stay away from a kind of thematic shows that would have been about the state of contemporary photography. His aim was definitely not to make a statement with that exhibition. His agenda was uh, different and, uh, as often with John, both rather laconic and very ambitious. Simply, I quote him, show the most significant recent achievements in photography, end of quote. But as time went by, many following editions of new photography in the late 80s and 90s adopted a kind of thematic background, even a rather loose one, including those curated by John Sarkovsky himself. For example, New Photography 2 in 1986, uh, that John also curated, presented the works of Marie Frey, David Hansen, and Philippe Lorca di Corsia. This was not a random selection, but a small show focusing on young photographers that, quote, have used the documentary style in ways that emphasize the plasticity and equivocation of visual meanings, end of quote. Especially exploring, with Lorca di Corsia and Mary Frey, photographies an even an easy relationship to the questions of narrative. Since that time, the series has oscillated between shows of unrelated artists and photographers and some with a general thematic structure. In the 19s, with uh, Peter Galassi at the head of the department, the series became more clearly international. And you have here an installation shot of New Photography 12, curated in 1996 by Thomas Collins, the department's Beaumont Newhall Fellow. New Photography 12 included, among others, as you see, the works of Wolfgang Tillmans uh, with his wall installation of images directly pinned to the walls. 
This edition was the first, and one of the very few indeed, not to have any US photographers included in it, and it was also one of the first that in those years started to move away from the more medium-specific tradition of the first years. The series in the second half of the 90s became more and more in dialogue with other mediums and art forms. The press release of the 1998 New Photography Edition that was curated by Darcy Alexander, who was at that time curatorial assistant in the department, used for the first time explicitly the term artist instead of photographer, underlining the fact that the four artists invited, Jane Dunning, Olafur Eliasson, Rachel Harrison, and Sam Taylor Wood, had all in common to be artists active in other mediums. Dunning and Taylor Wood in video, Eliasson in installation, and Rachel Harrison in sculpture. Leaving the walls of the gallery, as you see, getting out of the frames, photography was starting to expand. The 1998 edition was also the last one before the museum closed down for renovation and expansion. So in 2005, after a six year gap, the series reopened in the 2000 square feet of the Robert and Joyce Mansell Gallery on the third floor of the museum. And as you see, it's also the moment that MoMA decides to turn to color for ins installation shots. 75 years or nearly 100 century after the uh, invention of color photography. So let me just highlight for this more recent period two editions that are both related in some ways uh, to some uh, aspects of our 2015 edition. The New Photography 2009 that was curated by Eva Respini, which included six American artists who were, I quote her, working in the studio or the darkroom and whose images result from processes involving collection, assembly and manipulation from abstract to representational, end of quote. Or the 2013 edition curated by Roxana Marcosi, showing eight international artists who have, quote, expanded the field of photography as a medium of experimentation and intellectual inquiry, end of quote, with the books of Bumberg and Chalarin that you see here in the display cases, and the smashed picture of Brendan Fowler on the wall and inside the space of the gallery. So in 23 editions by 12 diff different curators, New Photography presented the works of 98 artists of 18 different nationalities, with a strong focus on Western artists and photographers. People sometimes ask what new mean. What does it take to be a new photography artist? New usually means young, but not necessarily. As John Sarkovsky already put it in 1987, statistically, statistically, such photographers are likely to be young, but old age in itself would not be a bar to inclusion. And some photographers over 50 from time to time were included in new photography. New at the beginning of new photography could mean that you had never exhibited in New York or in the United States. It is today less true as young photographers and artists have more and more opportunities and more platforms to show their work than 30 years ago. So probably two thirds of the 19 artists exhibited in New Photography 15 have one way or another already shown in the US. So new uh, is a complex and often highly subjective notion that follows certain criteria and sometimes don't. So if we nevertheless try to sketch the profile of the new photography artist from these 23 past editions, we would say that it is or was a Western man or woman in his, her late 30s with an academic background in art slash photography and having seldom exhibited in New York. So new photography is turning 30 this year. About turning 30, Francis Scott Fitzgerald would write in The Great Gatsby, and I quote him, 30, the promise of a decade of loneliness, a thinning list of single men to know, a thinning briefcase of enthusiasm, thinning hair, end of quote. I thought that to try to prevent that from happening, this anniversary edition was probably a good moment to slightly change the format of new photography in order to make it even more visible than it used to be, especially on the international scene. So this new reformatted edition occupies the nearly 6,000 square feet of the photo galleries with 19 artists of 14 different nationalities. And from now on, the series will follow a different pace every two years 
instead of every year. But on these changes and on the content of the new edition, I shall leave the mic to Roxana. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Roxana Markoch, Senior Curator in the Department of Photography, and it is my pleasure to welcome you alongside uh, Kantan Bajak. Now, I will tell you a few words about the current edition, and in fact, the question that Ocean of Images asks is not what is photography in the 21st century, but I think more broadly and critically, what is contemporary photo-based culture? And it specifically focuses on issues of connectivity, circulation, information networks, and communication models. The 24-7 image traffic that we experience today is not sui generis. It can, in fact, be traced to the mass media explosion of photographic pictures in the early 20th century, when, with the rapid development in 1924 of the lightweight 35 millimeter Leica camera, the use of perforated film, wide aperture lens, and the flash bulb, artists began to work at higher speeds, experimenting with montage and dynamic modes of media production. Now, this led the Weimar media sociologist Siegfried Krakauer to refer to the new phenomenon as a vital, though negative step towards enlightenment. In his essay, Photography, Krakauer argued that this blizzard of images catapults the photographic archive of modern life into the realm of allegory. Then, in 1983, just a few years short of the launching of the World Wide Web, the Brazilian Czech theorist Willem Flusser noted in his treatise towards the philosophy of photography that human civilization had seen two fundamental turning points since its beginning. The first occurred approximately during the second half of the second millennium before common era and may be defined as the invention of linear writing. The second, we are witnessing it, may be called the invention of technical images. He argued that given the transformation of textual into visual culture from the linearity of history into the photographic dimensionality of magic, a large part of our perception and interpretation of the world came to be shaped by transformations in photographic formats and image flux. Photographs, it turned out, had the power not only to depict or represent the world, but to be its co-creators with respect to how, what, and indeed, who we see in them. In other words, not only do we see the world photographically, but reality now widely consists of images. If you want a particular image, chances are it already exists. Before he died last year, the German filmmaker and political thinker Harun Faroki sketched a first draft of a history of computer-generated images, a study of the relations between reality and virtual video games in his film installation, Parallel 1 to 4. In the second film of this installation, at one point a woman voice asks, does the world exist if I'm not watching it? This is a question with roots in the philosophy of perception. In the age of digital connections, one is always engaged, looking, interfacing, communicating, responding, or processing within some telematic milieu. And when we delink ourselves, the internet still persists offline as a mode of life. So probing the range of a post-internet, post-production reality, Ocean of Images examines various ways of experiencing the world through images that are born digitally, made with scanners or lenses, in the studio or the real world, presented as still or moving pictures, distributed as zines, morphed into three-dimensional objects, or remixed online. The exhibition's title refers to the internet as a vortex of images, a site of piracy, and a system of networks. Ocean of Images presents newly commissioned and recent bodies of work that critically redefine photography as a porous field, where digital and analog, online and offline, virtual and real dimensions cross over. 
So coinciding with the opening of this exhibition, MoMA has also launched an online platform housing the live archive of the new photography series, featuring documents and images from its history. So I take this opportunity to thank the 98 international artists who participated in new photography since 1985, and the 19 exceptional artists of this edition, Ilita Zulei, Zbigniew Baladran, Lukas Blaylock, Edson Chagas, Natalie Czech, the collective DIS, Katharina Gensler, David Hart, Mishka Henner, David Horvitz, John Haug, Yuki Kimura, Anuk Gruthoff, Basim Magdi, Katya Noviskova, Marina Pinsky, Lele Saveri, Indre Serpitite, and Vieko Shiga. And with that, I'd like to give uh, the platform to Ili Tazulei. Thank you. I often begin my projects in the field, spotting building planned for demolition or in early stages of conservation, preservation or restoration. These architectural sites invoke personal or public narratives yet to be unearthed. During several visits at the site, I photograph all impressions left on the wall, such as scratches, holes, cracks, or marks that can sometimes lead to a discovery within or behind the walls. The project I will present shortly was the first site that revealed object within its walls. After exploring the building a few times and photographing its walls with respect to their texture and marking, I waited for the date of demolition. Two days after the demolition, I returned to the site and collected broken blocks and took them to my studio. Most of these fragments told the story of a problematic building, concrete containing many pockets of air and poor quality building's materials. One broken block, which I further hammered into fragments at my studio, revealed numerous belt buckles that were mixed with the concrete. These were the, the first unexpected object I found within the walls that led to a five years journey of what I call today fake walls. As I returned repeatedly to the same sites, I started to collect the fragments I found inside these walls metal, plastic and aluminum scraps, stones, glass shard, seashells, fish bones, apple seeds and broken toys. These scattered fragments, which no longer served a functional purpose, were taken to my studio, clean and then photographed with the same macro lens and always during the same daylight hours. Following the establishment of the Israeli state in 1948, there was the austerity period in the 1950s and 60s. Retired construction workers told me that they made use of improvised materials in order to finish the building and answer the massive demand of construction caused by the sudden waves of immigration to the new country. They told me that toward the completion of the building, they needed more construction materials, and most of the time, the answer they received was, we don't have any, we don't care, take whatever you can find and invent the walls. These workers found themselves searching for this material wherever they could, at factories, junkyard, etc. In almost every building slated for demolition, I found at least one wall made of various discard materials and object rather than cement blocks. <coughs> Observing those walls, I have learned that construction in Israel reflect the Israeli materialistic approach to object. For the most part, it is instant, cheap, and fast, implying a short conditioned affinity with the place. I would say a poor sense of tomorrow. 
Gradually, I created an extensive archive of photographs that I stitched together centimeter by centimeter, and this technique resulted in a large panoramic image composed of many points of views. I call them photographic plans. The project Shifting Degrees of Certainty that is being presented here in the exhibition Ocean of Images began during my five months residency at the KW of Contemporary Art in Berlin, developing my interest in archaeology of cities by collecting and photographing objects and architectural fragments in Berlin and in many other cities. In these sites, I single out site undergoing preservation, while in other, I examined buildings that were reconstructed brick by brick. I focused on public sites in accordance with the policy of Germans' conservation and restoration law. I collected information about every one of the objects or images that I photograph by writing letters to and visiting archives asking about the historical background of each object. I corresponded and interview monk at monasteries, squatter residents, taxidermy experts, plan researchers, building constructors, lawyers, and other experts. Once back in Israel, I organized and edited all the materials I had gathered in Germany. I also touched upon aspects I feel that needed to be included in the stories, things that should have happened but did not. At the studio, I recorded the story in three languages, Hebrew, English, and German, which are available to the viewer via an audio guide device. This work, Shifting Degrees of Certainty, is about the means by which information is being kept, classified, and the circumstances in which it's being released. Thank you. <laughs> and I would like to call Lucas Blaylock. Thank you very much. I, I have a bit of a cold tonight, so please bear with me if it sneaks up on me. So my work is an experimental practice that uses the camera, the computer, and often the studio as tools through which to draw out relationships. The relationships I'm interested in are caught between the depictive qualities of the camera, the virtual, po the virtual possibilities of software, the long history of picture making, and the oddness of things. I came to photography through an initial interest in writing and have never lost the sense that my work is made through invention in a language or a uh, set of conventions that are shared. But over the years, the terms of photography shared grammar have shifted dramatically. 
in great, in great part as a response to the sudden instant availability of millions of images via the internet. This shift has been compounded in my understanding, and I would say in our shared understanding, by the fact that the picture space internal to the photograph, which was once imagined as inhabited by the subject pictured, now is also inhabited by the possibilities and ambiguous spatial coordinates of the virtual. As the title of this panel and, and exhibition suggests, the first con this first condition primarily presents a problem of scale. By scale, I mean the relation of one's human experience or perceived agency to the oceanic scope of the information age. Lost my place. Uh, um, sorry about that. Uh, photographs have become images and relate to each other through their ubiquitous number more than through a sense of a common vantage point with another person, i.e. the photographer. If the picture in its classical construction presents an interiority to mirror the viewer's own, then the image functions more like a sign or shorthand for information. This in itself is not new, but has taken on a more prominent character with the digital. Over the years, this situation has made way for the development of an economy and a culture that move at a speed far greater than the human body can travel. And in turn, the participants in this culture are not so much our bodily selves, but are instead more like nodes in a network of dematerialized receivers. Not unimportantly to this line of thinking, the public face of this avatar is to a great extent generated photographically. So not only are the pictures less embodied when they're, addressed, when they're addressing the viewer or consumer, but this viewer has also become disembodied. In light of all of this, I've been thinking a lot about the picture as opposed to the image as the, terms, as the term of my work, and wondering to what degree this conception itself has an anachronistic or untimely quality. It is nothing if not an aging means of distribution. My own picture making, as I conceive of it, has surprisingly traditional terms, given my use of and interest in technology. And I find that I'm thinking about my work more and more through a relationship to the body of the viewer. A set of terms that the screen, and therefore the image, not to mention the oceanic digital archive, have a particularly difficult time addressing. The picture's bodily relationship presents an intriguing counterpoint to the haptic refusals of both photography's surfacelessness and the dematerialization of the digital. While still allowing me to work explicitly, and all of this sort of happens working in photography, still allowing me to work explicitly within the photographic language of the internet. Our bodies and the picture's physical qualities are alike in creating drag when it comes to e easy travel through these networks. And I've been excitedly considering this picture as distribution method as a means to address the kinds of human experience that the efficiencies of un unencumbered exchange leave out without having to turn my work away from our technological condition. What I am proposing is that the slow distribution system of the picture is, sets up a situation that can invite relationships between digital space and the nervous body. So internal to these pictures, I began to think of repurposing the digital tools meant for grooming the image to act more like tools in the classic sense as an extension of the hand. I first came to this by thinking about the hidden labor that had always been a part of making photographs, first in the dark room and later in the computer. And I started to consider all the procedural steps in my own process, and further the way the drawing of the objects I might be picturing might be continued after I, after I had used the camera. And I was and still am shooting with a view camera, scanning and then adjusting the pictures in Photoshop before printing. And I sort of found my current way forward by taking a cue from Brecht's writing on the theater and thinking about bringing the sort of offstage qualities of, the, of this kind of labor on stage and into the picture. I see a photograph as a picture made through a series of choices where each one of the procedural steps has the possibility to be performed differently. In the contemporary moment, this logic is now as present in vernacular photography, in a vernacular photography that includes Instagram as it is in the artist's studio. And I see my ham-fisted digital interventions as a burlesque or overpresentation of this hidden labor and see this activity as a means to connect so that the viewer might share this experience of looking and making with me. I'm thinking about the photograph the way you might describe the standard functioning in jazz. The standard is a popular song you expect the audience to know. So when you complicate it with improvisation, you're expecting them to have a strong sense of that deviation. The expectation for a photographic picture to look a certain way, to have a certain level of naturalism, seems to prove just this sort of standard. Thank you.
And I would like to introduce uh, Dis, the Dis Collective. Thank you. So what is DIS? This is the most difficult question for us because we really don't have an elevator pitch. It's not that easy to define. Um, our cultural interventions manifest across a range of media and platforms, um, but most notably probably DIS Magazine, an online platform that examines art, fashion, music, culture, while supporting and constructing new creative practices. We react to the moment, and I think that's represented in um, the issues and the projects that we commission and publish on, on DIS, um, but also the projects that we produce outside of DIS magazine. Essentially, where what DIS is to us is where, I guess, ideas, value systems, and everything else is not overtly analyzed or critiqued, but is actually reconfigured in its most heightened configuration. Over time, this has morphed and become a collective that functions as an umbrella uh, of this magazine, these images, and this own, um, among other projects. Yeah, we, yeah. One of our very first goals was to flood Google images with images composed of absurd combinations of tags like this, for example. And we, we always have been interested in working with these conditions of image saturation, the circulation, distribution, and overproduction of images, and reflecting on that. The aesthetic is the fall. Mass market apparel and stock photography model basking, models basking under a softbox with a certain uneasiness, but not a drop of irony. When the fashion brand Kenzo commissioned us to create their fall 2012 men's campaign video, we made a stock video as a fashion film. We kind of considered how um, the brands use artists in order to authenticate um, themselves, and we wanted to push this kind of commercialism, this this artist uh, artist brand collab to its it's actual, ex the most extreme place we could go. So this is the example. It's kind of working. And later we created these images, a fully operational stock agency that enlists artists to produce images available for private and commercial use.
these images, these images is dedicated to manipulating the coach and trends in stock photography. We always have been attracted to the weirdness and ubiquity of stock photographs. As well as the generic, the homogenous, the banality, and the hyper specificity that happens when you just mix way too many tags. Um, I think it's also interesting how the way that stock photographs seem to synthesize our economic, our social, our political, and our emotional landscapes into sort of these sellable products that are representational but infinitely versatile. And this, uh, this is an example of some of the artists that contributed. The previous was uh, Frank Benson, the next one, Katia Noviskova, Andy Breeze, Sean Maximo, Maja Kule, and many more. And many more. Yep. And most recently, we were invited to create a campaign for Ocean of Images. And here we use the Moma Logos material, the watermark, as an, as an annoyance, as an obstruction, as a brand, as a non art image. Transform into a watermark, the Moma Logo becomes synonymous with image ownership, low cost, high volume, royalty free content. And also under the watermark, we decided and we chose. Uh, the 2014 Eurovision winner Conchita Wars to be the face of the show and this new work. We picked Conchita because um, after winning Eurovision, she kind of became this ideological manifestation. Uh, she was a hybridized viral image. She was a 24 hour news cycle, a celebrated beauty, a political strategy, um, an economic asset and the new normal. She was also the face of a sort of European nationalism that we've been confronting lately. Um, they said that a vote for Conchita was a vote against Russia. That's what, that's what they said during that, the finals. Um, so Conchita is kind of this global superstar. She's an amazing performer, but she's also a viral image and she's an event. And I think it's really interesting to think about um, how viralness can actually, you know, contributes to the sort of flattening of history in context where the eventfulness of, of events tends to be measured actually in virality, in clicks, in views, in followers, et cetera. So um, we were kind of looking at like what is at stake when everything from Conchita to Boko Haram is tracked by the same units of measurement. Uh, the project is at the same time a marketing campaign and an artwork engaging with the magnitude of the MoMA brand and the accessibility of the iconic acronym transforming into a watermark. The MoMA logo is infused with new meaning. But for us, the most interesting is not the image, is neither the watermark. It's the tension between the image and the watermark. Uh, thank thank you. you. And the next. David Hart. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about two bodies of work that touch on some of the themes established by the exhibition. Specifically, I'll highlight the, the changing nature of information networks, both virtual and real. And I'll also address concepts of connectivity or, or our ability to respond and participate within a global discourse. Belvedere is a group of photographs and the title of my recent book, which was published by Dominica and New Documents. The text was written by Berlin-based architectural theorist Marcus Meeson. The subject of the work is the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, a conservative free market think tank and the originators of the Overton window. The title stems from a desire to relate the architectural folly, the Belvedere, to a public policy tool, the Overton window. Specifically, I was interested in the Renaissance practice of using an architectural device to frame and order the natural environment. This framing and the resulting asceticization effectively suggests a value proposition. What is in the frame is worth considering and beautiful. What lies outside the frame is worthless and ugly. The principle of the Overton window is to suggest radical policy is to shift, rather, radical policy to actionable policy. Functionally, it works by suggesting the extreme, so the less extreme seems reasonable in comparison. 
When, when engaging a site, one of the things that excites and interests me is the difference between the ideological potential of a site and how the space actually defines itself. That gap between one's experience of the space and one's knowledge of the activities that actually go on there. What's amazing about the physical structure of the Mackinac Center for Public, Public Policy is the efficiency. It's highly adaptable and entirely lacking in affect. It's a clean room for ideas. What's considered is how certain historical ideologies have become ordered, commodified, and instrumentalized, occasionally even weaponized, as they're selected and brought forward. Mutable, responsive, and networked, the center acts as a clearinghouse for strategies, collecting, developing, articulating, and then distributing specific responses to given social and economic conditions. As a corollary to this project, I'd like to show some images from a more recent body of work entitled Interval. It presents perhaps a more oblique representation of networks as outlined initially by Frederick Jameson in his essay, The Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. The work was initially commissioned by LAX Art as part of their occasional project. I chose to cite the piece in a former flower shop at an icon of postmodernism, the Bonaventure Hotel. The building was designed by John Portman and completed in 1976. The site not only references the history of Southern California architecture and the post-Fortis landscape that Los Angeles embodies, this deliberate siting attempts to annex the possibilities of architecture in a potentially post-ideological time. Jameson describes it as a total space, a complete world, a kind of miniature city to this new total eight, to this new total space. Meanwhile, corresponds a new collective practice, a new mode in which individuals move and congregate, something like the practice of a new and historically original kind of hypercrowd. Interval is a film installation comprised of source material from two locations. The first is Whitehorse in the Yukon, and it's the subject of a white paper entitled The Squatters of Whitehorse by anthropologist and geographer James Lotz, a protagonist in Glenn Gould's 1967 radio work, The Idea of North. He makes passing reference to the document in the work's narrative. It records the living conditions and habits for, of various individuals living in specific settlements around Whitehorse, from itinerant laborers involved in resource extraction to members of the Métis and First Nations community. The second location is Sakhalin Island, geographically part of the Japanese archipelago but Russian territory. It was a former penal colony and the subject of Anton Chekhov's only work of nonfiction, The Island, A Journey to Sakhalin. Historically, contested territory with a diverse population ranging from Russians, Japanese, and Koreans to an indigenous population of Gilyak and Ainu, the work is a rigor rigorous examination of the conditions and habits of the island's 19th century inhabitants. My interest in using these two locations has as much to do with Gould and Chekhov as it does with each site's conceptual potential as a marginal geography with a singularly focused economy. Both figures found it necessary to find subjects on the periphery of their individual societies in order to find the critical distance to comment on the center. The title interval references both the shared harmonic result of two notes struck simultaneously and temporal spatial displacement. Rem Koolhaas writes in Junk Space, there are no walls, only partitions, shimmering membranes frequently covered in mirror gold. Jameson acknowledges the emergence of a, cult, of a new cultural and environmental archetype. The structure is emblematic of the, of the emergence of the third stage of capitalism, the postmodern or the multinational. And even though he calls for a new form of artistic practice and cognitive mapping, he fails to acknowledge the emergence of a third kind, beings whose hybrid ethnography and experience of the world is, is as deracinated as the spaces they inhabit, virtually or otherwise. Perhaps this is the dream of Constant, a global nomadic population imprinting new narrative possibilities with every encounter, a permanent derive. Both Rem Koolhaas in Junk Space and later Hal Foster in his symbiotic text Running Room assume some of the same insights and prejudices present in Jameson's text. It prioritizes a late capitalist understanding of architecture's potential and its prevailing neoliberal narrative. Hal Foster writes in Running Room, in fact, junk space describes a stage of modernization whose energies no longer project forward into time, but fall back entropically into space. If, as Koolhaas suggests, that we're living in times in which architecture is no longer motivated by an ideological imperative, but is instead a pure instrument of capital, what does this mean to formerly marginalized communities, regardless of their physical location, and their ability to assert themselves within a global narrative? 
The strategy of traveling to the periphery in order to understand the pathologies of the center has to do with more than just adopting the methodologies of Gould and Chekhov. Perhaps the work addresses a new condition of constant hybridity, a prototypical hy hyperspace. It also has to do with our current understanding of a decentralized global culture, the redistribution of wealth and power, and a poetic analysis of two communities who, as a result of the flow of global capital, are in the process of active myth-making and re-territorialization. Thank you. So I'm happy to introduce Katya Novotskova. Um, um, for the Ocean of Images exhibition, I made a sculpture and an installation. Uh, and the installation is in the lobby of the museum, and the sculpture is in the galleries. Um, as a material in my work, I use images and text that I find through my research on the internet. From that material, I make sculptures, installations, books, texts, and online works, both collaboratively and alone. Uh, to put, uh, I'm also, uh, it's hard to capture practice in five minutes, but um, just to put it shortly, I think maybe what I'm trying to do is to somehow to understand and engage with the contemporary reality through the visual residue it creates of itself. That residue is mostly uh, massive on the internet in our urban and uh, commercial and media environments. I isolate certain signals from those environments and expand them, often quite literally, as objects in the exhibition spaces, uh, often mimicking existing formats of, um, of visual manifestations like uh, advertisement, uh, banners, and all these kind of things. Um, for I'm not a photographer. But um, photographic documentation of my work, of the, fine, of the sculptures and installations, is an inherent part of it. Um, I, don't, I do not really consider the work to be done without the documentation images that I sometimes take myself, sometimes not. But uh, the, sort of, the, the cycle of the image taken from the internet uh, then going back into it as a documentation of a work of art or something that could be a work of art is the work it's in, its, it's in itself for me. Uh, and um, to, uh, to kind of um, give you on a short, um, to take you on a short trip, I will now read a sort of a, um, a, a non-poetic poem of phrases that I, find are sort of useful for the, uh, for the work. And I think uh, for this whole idea of photographic imagery in the present uh, world and the sort of the geological reality of this ocean of images that we're talking about. Uh, ecological reality of images, ecological reality of vision. Images as natural structures, images as extensions of planetary flows of matter, proteins that capture light, light that becomes visual data, images as patterns of light to be recognized by someone, computational machines that process these patterns, neurochemical beings who process these patterns, the world as a place full of light, the world as a place morphologically pregnant with images, abundance of images, the socio-historical transformations of images, their materiality, and their observers. Optical instruments, inscription processes, visual representations, visual patterns that activate certain emotional reactions, visual patterns that activate certain behavioral reactions, formal and aesthetic complexities of these patterns, animal forms as patterns of activation, animal forms as patterns evolving since the dawn of time, human generated forms, emergence of those forms, patterns of, patterns of activation as manipulation, art as patterns of activation, art as patterns of manipulation, circulation of images, circulation of attention, interactions with images, images as products and currencies and commodities, 
purchased images, sold images, licensed images, stock images, poor images, political images, images as words, images as actions, images that capture ecological change, images that trigger it, patterns that are self-aware, patterns as narratives, patterns as conspiracies, encrypted images, images as encryption, domains of sharing, attention as a scarce material resource, images that as things that are fueled by human attention, attention economy, ecological reality of attention economy, ecological reality of digital economies, ecological reality of resource depletion, displacement, pollution, and extinction, industries that are fueled by human attention, images as transformations of earth minerals, markets of attention, viral patterns, viral narratives, Pattern processing as forecasting, pattern processing as fortune telling, images as speculations, images that capture actuality, images that express potentiality, images as echoes, traces, and imprints. Domains of seeing, seeing like a shrimp, seeing like a bird, seeing like a computer, seeing like a software, humans as image processing machines, images taken by machines, images seen by machines, images taken by robotic con computational machines on other planets, images of other planets taken by machines, millions of images we receive from space, images taken by machines of other beings, non-human beings looking at images, images in as interfaces between us and extreme frontiers of otherness, time, space, species, individuals, communities, Visuality of those interfaces, visuality of those frontiers, human non human visual data processing collaborations, domain of registering, images as code, images as electricity, images as screens, images without screens, images as surfaces, images as skins, images as membranes, patterns of display, chameleon skin as a screen, images as chemical reactions, image software algorithms. The artist as a bio-machine who filters visual patterns from its environment, making new ones that reveal something strange about the world. Art as pattern processing. Art as creation of patterns. Art as attention resource management. A never-ending transformation of patterns. A never-ending transformation of instruments. A never-ending transformation of representations. A never-ending transformation of interactions. Um, this is a, a sketch I in, in photo, that I did in Photoshop for the installation that I have in the lobby of the museum. And this is how I work. I uh, sort of, I, first I isolate images, then I make kind of very crude little sketches in Photoshop that then I proceed to somehow materialize into phys physical objects. The story with the spiders and the arrows and the termite mounds are not very clear to me, but the... My work often uh, comes from a temporal place. In the moment when I had to submit my proposal for this exhibition, the news broke out of recently discovered new species of uh, spiders somewhere in Australia. Um, they were called peacock spiders, and nobody no knew about their existence. And they turned out to be incredibly vivid and incredibly uh, formally complex. Um, and they went from being non-existent non-existent to being in high HD all over the internet within uh, within a couple of weeks. And so from nothing to viral, this was sort of the interest here. Um, and uh, since I've been working a lot with different geological surf images of different uh, geological surfaces like uh, Mars and other environments, the, the termite mounds felt kind of appropriate f uh, considering our urban environment around us. And the growth, uh, the potentiality arrow, the gro economical growth arrow, the sort of the investment arrow, and all those uh, things kind of make all together an altar of, of the sort of ocean of images that we're into. Thank you.
So I realize that you haven't seen the exhibition yet, uh, which will be opening to the public next week. Um, although Kaja's installation is in the Agnes Gant uh, sculpture platform, um, so you, you could see it. Um, but here were the presentations about um, the exhibition, not so much. We, we kind of didn't want to show you any installations from it. Um, I think you should experience that in person. Um, but the topic is on the table, and we are um, welcoming any questions from you. So please raise your hand, and the mic will come your way. No question. If not, I have a question maybe to, to, to start the discussion. I was really interested by all your, your presentation and by, and by what I would call uh, the absence of photography. When I mean the absence of photography is that I have the feeling that none of you use, for example, the term photograph. I think that David, you were the first uh, and the, the only one to talk about a set of photographs. Uh, you were all talking about image, about picture making. Um, and when you use the term photographic, it was always uh, linked to some, something else. Elite, you talked about photographic plans. Uh, this, you talked about stock photography, which is a, a photographic genre, and not photography in itself. And uh, none of you, of course, uh, considered herself or himself as a photographer. And in fact, the term photographer was only used once but by, by Katia to say, I'm not a photographer. <laughs> so um, I would like to comment. I would like you to comment on that absence of photography. If, uh, if, uh, if I think that's a, a good way to start the debate around uh, what is photography today, or try to give an answer to that question. It's funny, I think... Where is photography? Yeah, for me, I, uh, I actually normally start artist talks by claiming to be a photographer. So it's, uh, I didn't tonight, but I do, uh, I do feel like my work has a stake in, 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 uh, in thinking through that box, you know? Like, that if, if making a, a, a new work is sort of related to, inevitably related to some history, that the history of photography is definitely a history I'm still, still relating my work through. So I'm not sure I can go all the way to I am not a photographer. Yeah, I, um, I guess perhaps I don't have a, an aversion to being a photographer. Um, I, um, I realize, in fact, that's my training and it's um, one in which um, I, I, I definitely understand in terms of the way that I think about making work. It comes from a photographic tradition. Um, it has expanded into other media, uh, but I still really understand my practice within a photographic framework. Um, yeah, that's enough. Okay. Um, I'm in between the two because uh, I think till, till the years of 2008, I was the kind of photographer that's standing in the street with a tripod and a 4x5 camera or medium format camera and waiting for the event to happen. Um, and slowly, slowly, the machine itself became a tool in a, in a toolbox. And uh, today, in this specific technique that I use for many years, I use, of course, thousands of decisive moment. So in a way, I took a lot of step back from the originality of the sources of the um, rules of photography. And um, working with layers, I do need the actual uh, reality, the actual word. But entering with those material to the studio um, invent a new, a new way of thinking which I cannot anymore stand behind this uh, uh, term saying I'm a photographer. And that's why today I'm still uh, thinking about this new term of photographic plans, something that is uh, suggesting a new way of uh, perception and uh, a kind of um, accumulating uh, process that uh, at the end is finalized in two-dimensional paper, but inside there are a lot of uh, layers of uh, thinking, researching, uh, um, painting, and photographing as well. Uh, I just should mention that the 
<coughs> the series is called New Photography, but for the first time uh, we have a title, which it's really the first time since 1985 that this series has a title, and that is Ocean of Images, which doesn't include the word photography, it includes image too. So we are responsible a little bit about it. Um, yeah, with me it's just simple, I never had a training in taking pictures and the documentation images that I take of my work, they're sort of, they're not um, professionally done, let's say, so I'm more, uh, and as the work in general, it's just something that I have access to via the, base, the most basic means of a computer or a smartphone. Um, and of course these are basic means only certain sort of parts of the world but they're getting increasingly more basic everywhere and this freedom of taking the image, doing something with it, with existing techniques, photographic image, but in the end not really needing to produce it's your own unless it's like an Instagram photo of, of it or of something. But, um, so, and, I, and the other point is that for me it's there's nothing wrong with photography, it's just, it's it's fusing with everything else, you know. The point that I was trying to make is that even this boundary between you as a person taking an image and the machine taking the image is already blurring in some cases as well because there's a lot of AI in the camera and all that stuff. So that's also something I find interesting. And I guess, yeah, that's it. I mean, in, in our case, I think we use, I mean, we use photography as a, as a methodology. I mean, we are a collective, and definitely when, when we use this kind of pseudo, uh, professional, stock image way of doing things, it allowed us uh, to discuss ideas, it allowed us to discuss maybe goals, but we don't have to fight about kind of what I call sometimes the art plugin. You know, you, you don't come with, with your touch, and in a certain way, it frees us. So we just focus on the ideas. I think, I think we focus on the ideas, but I think also this has a history of um, strong messaging, you know. And we we're you know we have a we have a thing about trying to communicate or illustrate, and I think that comes from the first couple of years being really focused on the magazine itself, you know. So um, for us, I think content and art gets really blurry, and I think that's really interesting space to be in, especially like today, you know. Yes, there is that one question. If there, if there is an absence of photography per se, it's, it seems to me even more evident that there's an absence of humanness um, in the discussion and, or what I've seen and heard. This, I'm sure, reflects my age. Nonetheless, I'd love to hear someone speak about the fact that there is an absence of human content and social issues per se. So the post-humanist condition of the exhibition. I, I think it's, you want to say something? <laughs> Kanta, you wanted to say something? I'm not sure you know that uh, there's no social issues in this uh, in this uh, in this in this work. I think there are some uh, uh, questions that are both in a, that are uh, asked in an indirect way and probably uh, answers that are not statements, which is which is slightly slightly different. But for example, I have the feeling, Elite, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but yet I'm doing that. That uh, you, there are the strong social and historical issues in your work, both the work that you did in Germany, but also the work that uh, that you did in Israel and that you're doing still in Israel. Yes, for me, I would say that on one hand, uh, this technique of uh, uh, stitching so many ocean of images together um, is putting myself out of the frame because usually when I observe or um, observe any kind of a photograph, there is a, the um, a documentation of the machine standing before the image that we are looking at and before, the, before that we have uh, the documentation of the photographer pointing us some specific reality to watch at. So the, there is no way of hierarchy within the photograph, within any kind of photograph that happened with one lens. And uh, in this technique I felt that I'm stepping back out of the, 
of, of this position of being the photographer and trying to create kind of hierarchy. But on the other hand, um, uh, the work shifting degrees of certainty that I'm showing uh, here um, was uh, again my way uh, to reach the people, to reach the, the stories, to reach the people that stand behind archives or certain expert and to uh, trace and understand the hierarchy of the way information is being released and given by them. So for me it was a tool to come back to the personality behind the image. And in, in even in some cases, I couldn't even photograph the image because it wasn't um, allowed, for example, an uh, unlegal uh, collection of someone. So when I asked uh, if I can photograph the, the, the object, usually the answer was uh, you can photograph the shadow on the wall or the ceiling or the column beside it, but not the image itself. So the stories the, that the, uh, in the audio guide is talking about the image that is not there, but it's always connect to the personality, to the society that built archive, that uh, uh, classified certain information in archive. And in each archive, there is no axiomatic uh, system. There is a certain personality, and even I would say a certain mood that's standing behind it. And David, even if you didn't seem to want to answer, I have the feeling that your work could be called a political one. Hmm. I mean, yes, I mean, I think uh, I kept on fixating on the term that you use, though, humanism. And, um, um, you know, I think that um, in terms of the way that I try to adjust, address different kinds of possibilities. I mean, it, the work is, is uh, empathetic, or rather even sympathetic, towards um, the legacy of the different sites. And I kind of see each site that I engage with as a way to kind of tap in heuristically to um, that kind of experience and legacy, and really offering it up as a, as a kind of distinct kind of possibility in relationship to all of the other sites. So for me, it's important to kind of consider uh, the work in aggregate and to kind of think about all of these kind of individualized nodes that represent uh, distinct ideological positions. Um, um, and for me, as, as an artist, that's a deeply kind of humanistic um, uh, position to take, to try and encompass all of these different, even when contradictory, um, uh, ways of thinking about things. Yeah, and I mean, the other thing too about, um, because I was confused with the question maybe a little bit too, was perhaps um, the absence, yeah? And one of the things that I'm interested in, uh, as I stated, um, was um, I think the um, almost kind of, um, yeah, William Gibson talks about the soul's delay, yeah, and when he talks about uh, trans transatlantic uh, travel. And, um, uh, you know, kind of the inability of our sensorium to kind of catch up to the technology um, of contemporary life. And in some ways, I kind of think of, uh, of the built environment as um, a kind of um, ideological delay, right? Um, so uh, an environment is created to encompass one particular uh, mode of thinking and uh, um, in, in some ways to kind of support that as an enterprise. Um, but an ideology, in order for it to kind of remain um, uh, relevant, has to kind of evolve and, ch and change. So I'm interested in that kind of gap, if you will, between uh, the ideological perspective, or the ideological kind of construct of a space and then the ideology itself. Um, yeah, so. I can, I don't know, I have maybe some ideas. Um, I think the, like part of the thing that is maybe now that is so apparent with this idea of ocean and this massiveness, the scale that is beyond the scale of a human, um, is maybe what you have you felt as well of why why is there's no this human scale kind of connection. But I think the point maybe that isn't was not clear from my thing is that um, there are all these image production kind of contexts, they involve uh, meticulous human labor and meticulous human communication and empathetic uh, relationships between people and uh, non-people. And, um, and if, if it's not apparent on the image, it doesn't mean it's not there. So a lot of the times you can explore it via 
you know, the absence of the actual person maybe, but with the tools that the person was using and something like that. And in this, they have a lot of actual people as well. <laughs> it's a very collaborative project, so maybe you can. I, I actually don't think that it was a lack of human beings in the pictures that, uh, that prompted this question. I think it had more to do with the fact that, you know, people would go on the street and would take a picture of a demonstration, and that would be a very direct humanist uh, social engagement with an event. And I think you take a picture of a peacock spider um, that a scientist has put on the internet as a discovery. This becomes a sharing website, it becomes viral. And what your work really represents is not really nature, is not the peacock spider, but is the network. It's a representation of the network itself. And I think that one of the, what sort of uh, is um, linking all the artists and the works, and there are other works, there are all kind of works in the exhibition, but what links them is this, um, the f well, we, we, we kind of define this generation of artists as the post-internet generation of artists, but what it really means is that any type of cultural production or any type of m image that is made with a consciousness of uh, the network in which it exists, and that includes social context, human context, political context. Um, but yes, it doesn't have, it's, it's much more mediated and because the image has been circulated through a network. And um, that doesn't make it less human, I would say, or less socially engaged. Well, I think at one point, you know, to be a photographer, you had to be in sort of a privileged position to get your image circulated. And now there's, that circulation is everyone's circulation. So I feel like it's, it really sort of redrew the question of what you might do with a camera. Because it, it felt like those pictures weren't, uh, were, be, were still being made, you know, and still being, still being, uh, still being circulated. So I think as an artist, it was a, it became a different kind of question about how to engage those kinds of spaces. And I think a lot of, there's been a lot of interest in how these mechanisms work, you know, and how, how image culture does dispense of these things, or how, uh, how the machines that we're using to create pictures are functioning. Any other questions? Um, thank you, this has been very illuminating. Um, I'm wondering about um, what we call this. If you're not photographers, if it's um, not photography as some of us have, most of us, maybe all of us have known it, um, is it a, should it be considered a new genre? Um, and I'm also interested in how it, if, if it, and you may not be able to answer this, um, will exist as a kind of parallel to traditional photography as we have known it. Uh, well, I mean, um, it's interesting. I mean, we all carry in our in our pockets, you know, the possibility to to engage um, with the world as photographers or filmmakers, and 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 that's one of the things that I think about constantly. Um, and I, I definitely want to back away from the, the the. I mean, each each media has its own kind of um, its own properties of representation, um, and that's something that I think about deeply. Uh, specifically, you know, kind of registers of time. Um, and when, when looking at the world and thinking about um, uh, the sites that I engage with, I understand that I can represent the site and aspects of the site and my relationship with the site 
uh, very differently based on the choices that I make uh, in media. Um, for me, in uh, photography, I think um, so often it's been misconstrued in terms of, um, you know, kind of the mechanical operation, so the speed of the shutter, and we've kind of, you know, um, kind of accepted as a default this, this idea of, um, you know, the decisive moment. Whereas, in fact, I believe that uh, what photography allows us to do is to uh, think about the world um, in terms, of, in moments of time that are, um, that we as humans can't experience. And what I mean by that is um, a kind of geological time or an astronomical time. Um, astronomical, yeah, not astrological. <laughs> um, and um, I think it's important to kind of uh, understand the, the possibility of engaging with those dimensions versus, say, moving image, which is, you know, something which um, is much, has a much kind of deeper relation to our own sensorium. It's all about heart rate, heartbeats and, and, and breath. And um, so as an artist, you know, when I engage with the different media, I'm taking into consideration those types of possibilities and, and you know, when given the opportunity to actually, um, you know, show um, work that's a manifestation of both of those kinds of representations of time, you understand how space is um, uh, differentiated. Yeah, and um, it, it affects um, so much of, of, of what I do, I mean, uh, going back to um, you know the presence or absence of of the body um, in the film work I make, it's something that is uh, um, it's important to actually have the human body present as a way to kind of articulate uh, the space. Um, whereas uh, the photographic representation, I don't find it necessary. In fact, it makes it um, too temporally specific. Um, so, um, I mean, I think of myself very much as a photographer, but then I also think of myself very much as a filmmaker and as a sculptor. And it's the possibility of kind of engaging in that multiplicity of, 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 of modalities that's, um, um, that's, that's so rich about the current moment. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that... Um, just one second. I, w I was thinking, and I, I'm not quite sure that it's important so much that we have uh, this medium specificity. Um, I, I don't know how it helps, really. Um, but I do think that, um, well, I do think that because so much has been touched by the image in, the, in, in, our, in our time, um, it's a very difficult to understand, you know, for me it's more about a, an issue of perception really, you know, so it's, it's very difficult to understand the word without, of course, understanding uh, photography, without understanding cinema, without understanding three-dimensional modeling and without understanding animation and other forms of still and moving images. But you can call these formats, you know, things change, they have a mutability and uh, they could be called formats instead of mediums or even instead of... But it's true that that question of medium specificity was, it seems to me, very strong with a generation that is not yours. In fact, in the, in the 90s and even early 21st century, uh, there were a lot of works that were uh, turning around the, the death of photography, the death of that uh, um, analogical medium, and uh, the loss of that uh, specific relation to the to the real. I have the feeling that your generation, that is the generation in the you know, all in your thirties and early forties, uh, it's not relevant anymore for you. It's not an issue anymore, is it? No, it's not. But I wanted to point out something, I mean, because he's talking about traditional photography, and I would say that traditional photography hasn't been more alive than ever. I mean, right now, is it's, it's expanded all over the world. I mean, how amateur photographers embrace traditional photography never has been produced so much. So I think in terms of being alive, it's more alive than, than ever. Maybe not in this context, because we are not linked to that specificity, but in the world of photography, yeah. Sorry. I mean, I was just going to say that, I mean, we're also confronted with so many simulated images these days. You know, like every time you go to like the, you know, like Apple store or whatever, it's, they're all just 3D renderings. You know, they look like photos, like the 
it's really indistinguishable. I think that the term photography maybe is too closely linked to a format, you know, that's specific to a technique. And I think most of the people on this panel or maybe in the show have a sort of expanded view of image making and that's kind of, that's where we are, you know, in a way. medium specificity and um, I do think it's important to come up with a new term uh, rather than photographer because I remember 10 years ago about going to a photo review and because my work wasn't traditional um, they you know they pretty much booed me out and this went on and on so if they had been a term <laughs> to describe you know what I was doing which is you know working with imagery, not specifically with a camera, but it's photo-based. I, I don't know whose shoulders that would lie on to come up with a new term, but Visual art? Well, you know, there was the term post-photography that, uh, that, was, that was coined already, uh, already a long time ago, already in the early 90s. Uh, and that seems to be, uh, to me, not relevant because I don't think that we are in a post-photographic age. I think uh, what uh, you're doing is still photography that is technically writing with light. It's not through chemicals and it's through uh, digital and uh, um, captors, electronic captors, but it's still etymologically speaking, writing with light for me. Uh, you could say also that you're all para-photographers in a way that you're using images produced by, by some others. Uh, you could say also that uh, we are entering a kind of hyper-photography age that is, you know, making images even more accessible than they were and circulating uh, even uh, quicker than, than in the past. And you could also say that we're entering in a kind of pre-photographic age uh, where, in a way, there's no real medium to say the real, and which was, in fact, the case before uh, the arrival of, 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 uh, of, of photography. So, in a way, that post-photographic state would be also a pre-photographic state. So, yeah, just a few suggestions. Para-photography, hyper-photography, post-photography, pre-photography. I don't think that any of these is really relevant, so I prefer to say photography, which is, in a way, the common denominator in all these terms. <laughs> A certain topic, you know, I'm, I'm looking and I'm thinking all the time, ocean of images. Mm -hmm. And I think you choose that topic, I assume. So, ocean is to me, you know, something very humongous and big and indistinguishable and plentiful and accessible to everyone, etc. So, and when I think about the panels and the work, I think... I think there's a lot of, let's call it appropriation. It's using imagery, really, in, in many ways, and, and assembling them, because it's not the individual image, really. It's kind of tying into this unbelievable universe which exists where we actually have access to now. So I was just wondering whether I'm correct with that assumption and about the title of the exhibition. I mean, there, there are uh, both images taken, photographs taken by some of the artists directly and some that are uh, called from the internet, done something, done something else, reintroduced on the internet. Um, as, as we said, that the exhibition addresses very much this system, the circulation of images as much as uh, images in themselves. I don't know, maybe it has, all of it, maybe it has to do with immortality, really. I mean, if you think about, for a long time now, there have been uh, Roland Barthes, Georges Didier Berman, Susan Sontag, I mean, so many, so many um, theorists who have tried to understand over the years, not now, when we really are dealing with the notion of images, but just this accumulation uh, of pictures and the relationship between pictures and, and death, basically, you know, that, that has been a big subject for photography, death, you know. Um, 
So, you know, I was talking about Krakow a little bit earlier and the blizzard of images, and that came, I'm sure, at the moment when he was considering or resisting the idea of uh, mass death that uh, occurred in Germany after the First World War. So, it's interesting to think how this virality, the moment that you introduce an image and it's sort of uploaded and downloaded on so many blogs, on so many sites, um, that you cannot stop it anymore, that it has a certain permanence, you know. Um, that things have changed, you know, the, the, the aura of the picture which used to be in the original now is no longer in the original, it's in the sort of circulation uh, of the duplicate, you know, that, that counts much more, the aura exists in that, in the system rather than in the individual picture. At least this is what it is for this generation of artists uh, and for the subject of this exhibition. One thing, though, I just wanted to address, I think, I mean, photography, in my mind, is still a kind of uh, utopian medium in, in as much as it represents a kind of fixed set of ideals. Um, I mean, just the framework of, of, of the exhibition itself, right, where we're prioritizing physical objects in the space. Um, one of the things that happened earlier um, when we were doing a kind of pre-run uh, for the, the talk here was... Uh, both myself and uh, Lauren and Marco uh, were commenting on the oversaturation of the images as they were projected, which means that we've prioritized, you know, a way of thinking about and understanding how an image should exist in the world. Um, and I think that, you know, despite you know the the transience of of, of, um, of uh, and circulation of, of the media, we are still kind of here to assert a kind of prioritization of the physical image within the gallery space. And for me, that's a really utopian kind of way of thinking about, about the possibilities of photography, that it can transcend all of these things, um, but still remain very clear in our mind in terms of what it's supposed to achieve. We had long discussions about the title of the exhibition and that uh, liquid metaphor of ocean of images, in fact. Uh, we decided to adopt it because we thought that that was probably the, of all the metaphors around the, the internet, about around the post-internet edge, probably the most relevant, you know. Uh, one of, it appeared, what, in the 80s? And uh, I think that uh, it's still relevant after so many technical, technological changes, you know, uh, the fact, of course, that you can still surf, navigate on the web, that there are some pirates on the web, web, web as, as uh, Roxana mentioned, but also, you know, the fact that uh, now today we're talking about big data, but when we're talking about big data, we're talking about streams and waves, etc., etc. So the liquid metaphor is, is still uh, very relevant today, and if you expand, in fact, that metaphor, if you expand that kind of liquid metaphor, and if you think of photography as something liquid, it's really interesting because uh, it really, I think, uh, uh, points out or underlines one of the uh, most important aspects of the exhibition, the fact that photography can take so many different forms, that it's such so malleable, uh, so protean, so multifaceted, and that it, can, it, it, is, it is almost like a, like a liquid. So if you really expand that, that metaphor, it's not only about, you know, uh, having images uh, um, all over the place and having all these images that arrive to you. So in a way, it's slightly different from the blizzard of images of Krakow, but it's really about uh, the liquid nature of photography in a different way, as Jeff Wall was talking about the liquid intelligence of photography, but the liquid nature of photography. Mm. And that goes back to the pre-photographic almost, right? And that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Any other question? Maybe one more. No? Well, then on that note, I would like to thank um, our artists and our audience for joining us this evening, and we will have a little reception just outside. Thank you. Thank you.